Greetings, YouTube. I am currently reading a book uh, called The Catapult by Rihill, um, R-I-H-I-L-L. -L. And it's fascinating if it does occasionally get a little deep in the weeds when it comes to throwing a hell of a lot of Greek names at you in rapid succession. Um, they kind of like just buzz past me after a certain point. I didn't, I've never been able to wrap my head around a lot of the Greek pronunciations. Um, and he's starting with the Greek era, and I believe he covers a thousand years of catapult history. I'm not positive. I, I, again, I'm about a third of the way through the book. Um, and he was talking about how the term catapult at one time was far more generic than we would consider to be a catapult as our modern vis visions of what a catapult is. You say catapult, a lot of people will think trebuchet, which is probably the most advanced version of a single arm catapult ever created. Um, great deal of, re of repeatability, so long as your missiles are, uh, are roughly the same weight. Um, well, the early catapults grew very much out of bows. So they were tension devices. They were tension machines. Like a bow, you pull them back. It's, it's essentially it was a precursor to crossbows. Um, but those will only take you so far. After a certain point, you just can't get a bow big enough to get you any more energy because you're having to have a hard time finding a, piece, a single piece of wood or even a composite collection of, of, of materials that are going to get you the energy you want. Then you need to leap in torsion. Now, torsion is when you're using a skein of hemp, or pardon me, hemp, or uh, sinew to create a spring. And now you're using solid arms that, that, that don't have any spring into themselves. They're just solid wooden beams, essentially, properly shaped and tapered and such. And when they go, and they're being pulled back against the torsion, you know, on the skeins of, of uh, uh, hemp or, 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 or sinew, and then they snap forward. And that means you can get a lot more energy because now you're just going to have to get wood that is strong and straight and not have to be, do any bending on its own. It just has to be rigid and strong. Um, but the, a lot of them were being described as things that would have been used by people. So they were very much at least the research, and I trust this dude, um, that they were being used, not necessarily in the field like like this, but maybe on a wall, uh, potentially things like that. And they would be casting both sharps, which is how he refers to uh, darts and arrows and, 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 and larger projectiles that you know could be, we, we would be, see them as being in a javelin or even spear sized, um, or stones in some cases, literally stones, and in others, of course, being uh, lead bullets. And there's this wonderful picture he has in the book of a collection of sling bullets that had been found in a collapsed tower. So essentially, you had this tower with all these munitions in it, the tower collapses, and so we had this wonderful snapshot of what was in that tower at that moment in the battle. And it was just like, was this array of 81 sling stones exactly the same because they'd all come out of the exact same mold and to see industrialized munitions in the classical era just made me smile like a schoolboy it is just so cool um also sometimes you'd find them with inscriptions on them cast into them of uh names of people used it uh mottos uh, military units and then of course soldiers being soldiers you would occasionally things, see things that they would like say, eat this. Um, and the sling bullets, now they understood that spheres worked well, but uh, a lot of sling bullets were football shape because a football shape gives you a point on each end, um, which has a certain st stabilization, as that's the reason footballs are shaped the way they are, um, and you get more of that energy coming into that point of impact, uh, which does more damage when it lands. Now, the sling bullets that he's been looking at in the book, at least to the point, fell in the category of between 18 grams and 500 grams. That's a, that's a big range, okay? And some of the wounds is being described sound very much like bullet wounds. Literally, the descriptions they are giving and the treatments of the wound of having to get these, these bullets out of someone because they've penetrated the flesh and, and they've done massive amounts of contusion damage in such a, uh, organs or, or muscle 
and you're having to remove these bullets just like you would have to remove a bullet in the modern era. And his argument is, is that these bullets would have been fired from either tension or torsion or torsion man portable uh, catapults, what we again what we would perceive as being a version of a crossbow. Um, because you could not generate the kinds of velocity required to make that kind of a wound with your classic David and Goliath style sling, which is you know a, a length of uh, a length of cord, a loop on one end for your finger, a pouch in the center for your missile, and then uh, ending in a uh, a tassel because the tassel helped uh, dissipate the energy after you release, so that your it's less likely to come snap, snapping back and hit the person using it. Now realize that professional slingers and even legionnaires, who the Roman legionnaires, who would have been using slings as supplements to, to combat, who were not professional slingers, though so they would have employed professional slingers, um, but they're strong, seasoned people used to using their muscles in, in on a daily basis. I mean, it was said that the Roman legionnaires would carry 90 pounds of gear and even if you think of that as like a you know a medium lo medium load in like a D and D concept, that's still something with like a fourteen strength, which is forty percent above average. Quite reasonable to expect for a soldier to have a strength forty percent above what the average would be for your average you know your, your, your Joe off the street. But I just spent about I don't know less than an hour doing some research here on YouTube, and I know that. Rye Hill did not have access to YouTube, and there was not necessarily the same community of slingers when he wrote the book, I think it was written in 1985, that there are today. So finding slingers that would have had lots of useful data would have been harder for him than it is for me, and I just literally clicks away. And But doing some research has shown me that using, I saw one guy using three different lengths of slings, 18 inch. 21 inch and 41 inch, so some significant differences in these, and using uh, stones, not bullets, but stones, ranging like I think it was like 50 grams up to he would he the biggest one he did with any kind of a success was over 500 grams. So again, right in the range of a classical era round, you would have found a upper end of what a bull would have been, which is around 500 grams. So that's a ha that's that's a pound of lead coming at you. Now he just guy was just using stones, which are larger, ovoid, not and have points on the ends. And he was generating in the range of like 120 to a to 180 joules of power. Now on the low end a nine millimeter bullet is generating 115. So with a sling and just stones on a beach, he was generating the same amounts of energy as you will from a 9mm round. Now, admittedly, on the low end of a 9mm round, 9mm rounds can go far higher than that, because um, you can really get some you know, hot loads for, for, for a firearm. Um, but the point is, is that a sling used by someone who knows what they're doing, and this dude does, he would be, have been the equivalent of a professional slinger, or even a skilled you know, legionnaire who isn't a professional slinger. They, are more of a, they have far more weapon training than just the slingers who really emphasize being good with a sling. Um, he's generating the same levels of jewels as a 9mm round. So I'm looking at this going... I got to disagree with Ryhill. Yes, you could do this. Now, admittedly, to get a penetration, that's going to be a, a, a round on the small side because you don't want to get down low as far as gram size because you want that energy coming into smallest pieces possible, smallest surface area as possible to penetrate the, fl the, the skin to get into the, the, you know, the, the flesh and organs beneath. But even if you're not penetrating the body, if you're launching a 200 gram missile at 180 joules of impact, and I saw this guy doing the same, doing 
hitting a nine inch square target because he was it was this a span and the span's about nine inches. It's my span's about nine inches. Um, a nine inch piece of paper at fifty meters. And I don't know about you. That's my head. And he hit that target with a lead bullet at that was going to be generating 150 to 180 joules of power. So even if it wasn't small enough to like pierce the skin, it still would have been enough to break bone, to crush skulls. You hit someone in the face, and if they have an open helmet or they have no helmet or at all, you're going to at the minimum take them out of the combat and quite possibly kill them with that single shot. And if you hit them somewhere else in the body, you're very likely going to break a bone. You hit someone in the arm like that, that arm doesn't work anymore. And now you've taken that person out of the, out of the battle, and now you have all the supplemental people who have to help that soldier. So you've actually done more damage to the enemy because now they're wasting more resources than just a dead guy. In addition, there's the morale impact. After the battle, dead people, they can inspire people to go, go to war, but you see guys who now have lost limbs or missing eyes or a piece of their skull is gone and now they spend the rest of their life drooling. That's going to have a negative impact on the morale of the army now, isn't it? So the live victims could be, from a propaganda point of view, more valuable to an enemy than a dead soldier. But I just, it's, it's weird because he, because Ryhill goes into such degrees of detail and research that to miss the fact that there were people living at the time he wrote the book and alive now today, able to produce energy levels that would have done exactly what he said was only be able to be done with a torsion or a tension catapult, but you can do it with a decently crafted sling in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. And a sling is much easier to carry around. It's super cheap to make. You can use just rocks if you get in a pinch. And of course, it's better if you're using lead, lead missiles because dense, small, uniform, that makes your job a lot easier. If every missile you're firing is exactly the same weight, you get much better at, at you know, landing the, the, those shots at, at a target that you want to hit. And realize if you're firing in mass at an enemy, if you've got, you know, a hundred slingers all launching their stones or their bullets at an enemy, you're not aiming at a guy. You're aiming at that line of guys. So the possibility that you'll hit something, particularly if there's, you know, ranks is pretty darn high. Now, shields, good armor, that's going to protect you. But not all soldiers had that. Some of those folks were conscripts. They were cannon fodder. They were given a shield, a helmet, and a spear, and they were shoved out in the front line to soak up the damage until the trained troops, troopers could get up, up front and do their thing. So, yeah, just slings, in my opinion at least, and again, it didn't take me long to gather this information, and these guys doing this slinging in the modern era are giving hard numbers. They're putting the weight on the, the bottom of the screen. It says the weight of the object, the, num the feet per second, the number of joules. It's, it, 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 he's giving you the exact information that you need to look at this. And it was, it, again, research cost me nothing, just 50 minutes of my time. And it's stunning how dangerous a sling is, and it also makes me think of how poorly they are represented in role-playing games. They just aren't represented well. Um, now, I understand that they're considered simple weapons, and, and it's the conundrum of role-playing games as people equate simple in construction with simple in use. A sling is a simple thing to, to make. Give me an hour and in instructions and paracord, I could probably make you one. But I can't use one. It takes a long time to get good with one. So, so because something is simple to produce doesn't mean it's simple to use. And to scare off, you know, coyotes and, and things, maybe you're doing doing the classic D and D's type sling, 
you know, like the, the, the used by you know shepherds the world over. But the larger ones, used by well-trained individuals, those should be doing much more damage, and probably having better ranges. I don't actually don't off the top of my head remember what the range for a sling is in Pathfinder First Edition. Um, but if this guy is hitting a human face at a at 50 meters, that's more than 150 feet away from you. That's impressive for a weapon that is easily concealed, incredibly cheap, and you can't just use stones. So ammo is literally lying everywhere around you. Admittedly, bullets do better um, because, again, smaller, denser, uniform, makes it easier to train. Uh, yeah, just frigging fascinating for me. I eat this stuff up. Um, but I mean, I've talked about slings before, and it just, they really should be doing more damage in the hands of somebody who knows, that knows what they're doing. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I've kind of always house-ruled that if you have a sling as a simple weapon, fine, but if you have any kind of martial training, it goes up one die, because you know how to use a weapon more, better than someone that's just picked it up as a hobby or picked it up because it, they were, you know, constricted into a, a militia or something. They're not professionals. They're just using this as a, as a last-ditch effort. But if you're a professional, you'll be able to take, you know, full uh, full advantage of what a sling can do. But even that, even bumping it up, which I think goes from like a D4 to a D6, just doesn't seem to really reflect how much damage this thing is doing. Because you're doing as much damage as your arrow or a crossbow bolt. You're doing as much energy as damage as a bullet for a far smaller investment. Bows and crossbows are expensive and more, more difficult to maintain and more adversely affected by the weather, as were early firearms. Even modern firearms are. Whereas a sling is going to work pretty much any time you need it to work. Just fascinating. I think I'm going to make myself a paracord sling. I don't know if I ever get to use it, but I think it'd be kind of cool to have one. Um, but yeah, so again, I've blathered all long enough, but I just, I, I was kind of a little disappointed that R Rihill had not done the level of research by contacting people who actually use the things. As I can guarantee you, when he wrote that book, people were using slings as a hobby. They may not have been able to same networks. They may have been more difficult to know contact than they are in the modern era but at one time i was a member of the world at lattle association even though i never used the at lattle i just thought it was funny so i became a member of the world at lattle association um but yeah so let's talk about slings and just how dangerous they are 